Hey, I'm Michaela Lefrac, the host of Vermont Edition. The podcast you're about to listen to has been edited for clarity and brevity. Happy listening. This is Vermont Edition. I'm Michaela Lefrac. We've got a packed show for you today. Later in the hour, we will learn how this maple sugaring season is going and hear about the upcoming festivities across the state for Maple Open House Weekend. We'll also talk to a community organizer in Brattleboro about the work going on there to bolster the local music industry and make it more diverse. But first, Burlington has elected a new mayor, Emma mulvady Stanick. Her introduction comes with a lot of firsts. She's the city's first progressive mayor since 2012, its first ever woman mayor, and first openly LGBTQ plus person to hold the position. Mulvaney Stanek is also a former city councilor and a current state representative. During her acceptance speech on election night last week, she addressed the historic nature of her win. I did not see a leader like me when I was growing up in central Vermont. I did not see a woman. I did not see a mom who has young kids. I did not see a queer leader. And it took years. And that matters because we need to know, our young people need to know, our adults need to know, everyone needs to know that representation matters. Because decisions change when you have women at the table, when you have moms of small children at the table. marginalized people at the table, decisions change because you remember that humanity matters. You remember that people matter. You remember that young people matter, that children matter. You have come to the table with a different orientation and a different perspective. Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek, Burlington's mayor-elect, welcome back to Vermont Edition. Thank you so much for having me. We're glad you are here, and congratulations on the win. Listeners, you can join this conversation as well. What questions do you have for Burlington's first new mayor in more than a decade? There's another superlative for you. You can give us a call. Our number is 800-639-2211, or send an email to vermontedition at vermontpublic.org. Emma Mulvaney Stanek, your win, to be <laughs> frank, as you might have heard, caught caught some folks by surprise. It was a tight race, but you won 51.2% of ballots cast. That's almost 1,000 more votes than your leading opponent, Joan Shannon. W- what made the difference in this race? What do you think? Well, you know, first of all, I, I'm not actually that surprised um, <laughs> because I, well, to be honest, I've been yeah. involved in many political campaigns over the last 20 years in Burlington and elsewhere in the state. Uh, I have been a labor organizer and political organizer for most of my career, and I'm a very hard worker. Mm. And I knew by amassing a team of 300 volunteers, many of which are organizers, that this was not only possible, but I felt the momentum shift in probably late January, early February, as Mm. more debates started to happen, as I started to be able to engage more undecided voters. I really felt a shift happen, and, uh, and then the momentum just kept building from there. So it was a lot of good, good old organizing, engaging every ward in the city, and really deeply listening to folks that I think really won the day. Mm. And you also uh, pulled a lot of crossover votes, too. I mean, voters really split the ticket in this race. Um, you're a progressive. They voted for you, as well as you know, sometimes their Democratic uh, city councilor. Um, what, what do you think about the, the high number of split tickets in this race um, and what that says about your approach, your priorities? Well, it really affirms my messaging and my core values that I really brought to this campaign and how I built out my platform, because it shows how much of a a coalition I was able to build in terms of the of the support and the win that I that I achieved on Election Day. And to me, I always talked about how this is bigger than any um, political label. It's bigger than being a progressive. This is about the needs in Burlington today and who has a vision that has both uh, a focus on immediate needs, but long term solutions that won't further 
further harm our community that is currently suffering. And as I look at the vote results, I looked particularly at the North District and South District. So for folks not from Burlington, that's the New North End and the South End. And wards four, five, and six, which are within those districts, uh, really showed the most uh, numbers of those crossover voters you were speaking of. And those are where there are um, a lot of long-term residents. Those are folks who are um, have families like mine, who have small kids, homeowners, et cetera. So, and there was a surge of also um, some young folks engaging more. But to me, it just shows the wide appeal that a, a message and a platform that's built on uh, humans, <laughs> built on a valuing of folks with and treating folks with dignity who are truly suffering, the, the folks who are unhoused and suffering a substance use disorder in our, in our city. At the end of the day, people want that hum, human-based vision um, that really brings back the vibrancy and the health of, of Burlington. Mm. Well, you are just a couple weeks away now from starting in your new role as Burlington's mayor. You're still a state representative, though. When do you plan to resign from the legislature? Well, it's interesting. I just walked over from the state house to do this interview, <laughs> so I'm still doing both jobs. You know, interestingly enough, uh, you you start sort of. I didn't realize this right the day right after the election ends. Even though I'm not sworn in, I'm not being paid yet to be mayor, so it is a lot to juggle between now and April 1st. But we're already hard at work with uh, building a. We have a transition team and a meeting with lots of advisors from all political stripes because that was important to me during the campaign. It's continuing in my transition to advise how to build out my office of staff and also how to start thinking about engaging department heads within the city. So there's there's work already underway. And my plan for my state rep seat, um, just uh, to be very both thoughtful about it, um, but also strategic, is I'm hopeful that I can find um, a, a list of folks to submit to the governor to replace me as quickly as possible. But I'm also being very thoughtful around how long I've seen the seats that have been vacant while I've served of colleagues go unfilled for a number of weeks. And I want to make sure that there are critical bills that get passed and, and sustain um, a veto if the governor chooses a veto, particular legislation that really is critical for Burlington. And one in particular particular is H72. It's a bill on setting up two pilot overdose prevention centers in Vermont. I've long talked about in this campaign making sure one of those pilots would be located in Burlington. It's a critical tool to save lives with folks struggling with substance use disorder and getting people into treatment. And I'm very concerned that that will get vetoed. And so I would hate for my uh, vacant seat to be a determining factor on whether we're able able to override a veto. So I'm weighing all those options in the coming days. Mm. And do you mind just for a moment explaining to our listeners what the process is like for when you do uh, resign from the legislature to become Burlington's mayor? What happens next? Sure. Well, technically, under the state constitution, I could total, I could uh, technically serve in both capacities. That's not livable <laughs> and not not fair, frankly, to the constituents of my district, uh, Chittenden 17. So the process would be, uh, for any reason, a state representative or senator can resign. It's simply submitting a letter to the House clerk. Um, but then uh, from there, the the, depart- the uh, party affiliation of the outgoing member would hold a district level um, nominating committee of members from that party, and you would submit a list of two to three names to the governor. And then traditionally, the governor uh, usually appoints someone from that list or at least from that same party affiliation. That has been the past practice for uh, Republicans and Democrats, et cetera. So I am hopeful that the the Governor Scott would honor the progressive um, affiliation that I ran under and and pick someone who is very capable off of a list that we would submit. Mm. And not to beleaguer the point here, just briefly, there it sounds like there is a chance, though, that you, you're considering staying in your position as a state rep even after April 1st. Right. I've been transparent with my constituents, and um, I welcome folks to be in touch with me if you haven't, if folks haven't weighed in yet. But people understand um, the the critical nature of making sure that we get legis- critical legislation mm-hmm. passed that benefits Burlington. And so I think they're honoring the fact that sometimes it does come down to one or two votes. And for, for me, it's about six weeks uh, from April 1st to the end of the session at the end of my two-year term already that I, I would hold both things um, and just go down for very key votes as necessary at the state house so I could 199% focus on uh, starting off as mayor. But to me, this is part of being a good leader for Burlington is making sure critical state legislation uh, pass, passes and prevails so that we can do what we need to do in Burlington to build back this healthy and vibrant city. Mm-hmm.
Well, let's talk about your upcoming first 90 days in office, a critical period for a, a, a newly elected politician. What specific actions do you plan or promise to take in your first three months as Burlington's mayor? Well, as I said, I'm already hard at work meeting with uh, incoming city councilors, and I'm setting up meetings with department heads, as well as the four city unions um, that represent the the workforce of our city, um, city government, that is. And so those first 90 days, I'm hoping to really hit the ground running and to really have some critical relationships in place so we can really start to tackle Uh, understanding community safety, and also working on the fiscal year 25 budget. Those are the two biggest things in the first three months uh, that I will start to really focus in on. I've talked on the campaign, and I want to work with city council about creating a special assistant to the mayor's office that would be a temporary role, not permanent, um, but one that would really be able to understand how we're delivering community service today, our community safety today, um, how we, where the gaps are, where the opportunities are for more efficiencies, but more effectiveness, most importantly, so that when people call for help, they get the appropriate professional help from the city. And that will take bringing a lot of department heads together, community partners, the Howard Center, our medical community, to really uh, grapple with that. And that is why I, I really think that assistant um, a special position. It will be very strategic to inform both the council and my office about where Burlington needs to go, because what we've been doing so far has not worked. And then with the budget, I'm sharpening my pencils. And really, actually, I'm, I'm already thinking about a list of advisors, again, from different political backgrounds, to really help me um, grapple with the budget deficit that I will be um, grappling with, along with um, the city councilors, to really think about a budget that that reflects our our priorities today um, and reshuffles things where we have the ability to and the political courage to, to really acknowledge that maybe some projects need to be phased in on a slower timeline in order to free up resources for the critical acute needs around community safety um, and and making sure that our community uh, is able to meet the basic needs of the folks in our city today. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Burlington's mayor-elect, progressive state representative, Emma Mulvaney-Stanick. Our number is 800-639-2211 if you have questions for Burlington's incoming mayor. Now, uh, Emma Mulvaney-Stanick, we had you on a week or so before the election, and, and one of the topics we discussed was public safety. And one of the key differences that emerged in those interviews and throughout the campaign between you and your Democratic opponent, Joan Shannon, was uh, around uh, policing in Burlington and the handling of drug crime in the city. Uh, First, your opponent, Joan Shannon, was endorsed by the police and fire departments. I'm curious what you are going to do in your early days in office to um, to to bridge what might be a gap there between um, you and and other progressives in city council and the police and fire departments. Make those relationships strong. Well, I think it's a good question, and I've already gotten to work on that. Um, I'm a former labor organizer for most of my career. I worked for the biggest labor union in Vermont, Vermont NEA, and supported public school teachers and staff throughout the state. So I'm no stranger to labor unions, um, and all labor unions have different processes for how they engage in politics or not. Many don't even engage in local local elections. And so I've already reached out uh, to the leadership of the BPOA, which is the Burlington Police Union and the Firefighters uh, Association, which is um, represents the Burlington firefighters, and have open opened my hand to say, let's. I look forward to working together. Let's start building that relationship uh, since we did not have an opportunity to engage during the campaign as they made those decisions early on. And I, for me, this is about as much about making sure that we have the resources that they need to be successful in their jobs. But I want to dive a little bit more deeply and understand what innovative ideas do they have um, to make the city stronger in its community safety response? What culture changes um, do they see as needed to help retain critical staff in their departments? We've seen long before 2020, which was such a big focal point in the campaign around the resolution to reimagine how we do policing and really grapple with racial justice um, issues, given what was going on in the country, uh, 
uh, and at the time with with bias in policing and harm to black and brown folks um, at the hands of some police. So we've had a retention issue in the Bur- the Burlington Police Department in particular for many years before 2020. So I want to dive into that a little bit and really understand uh, where are the opportunities, where are the challenges to work in partnership with with um, both the police and firefighters. And I will tell you one perfect example in the last year is the uh, from the rank and file of the firefighters. Um, they came up with an, uh, the idea for a pilot response uh, program to send a smaller squad, a more efficient and nimble squad out to uh, uh, support and check on people uh, suspected of having an overdose instead of a big fire truck and an ambulance. That's the kind of creative and innovative thinking I want to welcome to the table and work in partnership with um, the rank and file staff, but also the department heads and to really collaborate going forward. Will you reappoint Burlington's police chief, John Murad? Well, John and I are setting up, sorry, Chief Murad and I are, are about to set up a, uh, a meeting to, to really uh, start to build our relationship. And we, for me, with all department heads, this is about starting that relationship and seeing the vision that they they have, the, how that aligns with my vision for Burlington. I want to learn more about leadership styles and their assessments on their departments. And I very much welcome a chance to um, see if a partnership between Chief Murad and I can work going forward. I think that's in the best interest of the city of Burlington. And um, to make that work, it, we have to both be flexible about um, finding common ground to move forward. So I'm hopeful, and we'll see how things go. All right. Well, in your acceptance speech, you said, uh, we did not talk about climate enough in this campaign. Uh, The conversation was uh, often dominated by uh, important conversations about public safety and uh, housing, uh, the drug crisis, et cetera. But uh, as you said, climate didn't come up all that much in this mayoral campaign. Uh, What are your climate priorities? Yeah, I'm su- I'm actually surprised that there wasn't a debate at least focused on climate because we if for a while there I think we did eight or nine debates community safety was took up a lot of the airtime and so for me some of my priorities are to to honestly review the city's current climate action plan and really dive into why our use of fossil fuel numbers are actually coming back up the whole premise of that plan is around getting to net zero for fossil fuel usage by 2030 and the numbers have started to come back upwards rather than downwards um, after um, I think the, an update was done in 2021 or 2022 so in order for us to address that I think we have to think more boldly and be honest around uh, what are the biggest pieces of of uses of uh, um, behaviors or, or um, yeah, just behaviors that will that will impact fossil fuel usage. And it's usually transportation and heating sources. This plan, though, doesn't talk at all about um, the other elements that impact climate, like gas ho- uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and how our McNeil, our publicly owned McNeil generating plan, and the airport, which is municipally owned also impact um, our impact on the climate in terms of the emissions from airport, the airplanes and emissions from the stacks at McNeil. So I'd like to expand our, our climate um, plan to really reflect that and think innovatively of where can we continue to push Burlington. I talked about um, looking for a transition for McNeil in terms of its fuel source, which is carbon-based, it's wood. And while, yes, it's better than a lot of other options, I think for someone who has small kids like I do, I know that my children are about to inherit a very different Vermont and Burlington, even 10 years from now, things will look different. Um, Our weather patterns will look different, the amount of storms that we're having. Um, It's and so for me, there's an urgency about continuing to push ourselves and not and not sort of just settling for, well, this is all that's the option right now. I think we have to be constantly researching and looking for other places in the world, frankly, that are pushing pushing the, uh, their municipalities to do more on climate and be more impactful. Mm. We'll, we'll look forward to following where those plans go in the upcoming weeks and months. Uh, before we have to wrap up here, I want to make sure that we do have a moment to talk about housing and the affordable housing crisis that both Burlington and the entire state frankly, the entire country is facing right now. Now, this week, the city council unanimously approved some initial agreements for a redevelopment plan that was put forth by the current mayor, Maria Weinberger. And under this plan, two different projects would bring about 1,300 new housing units to the city. Uh, what what do you think of these initial plans? And, and how will you ensure that, that plans to bring new housing into the city move forward efficiently? 
Well, I think we have long been behind about putting more units online and building enough housing uh, throughout the state, as you mentioned. And so I'm encouraged by some of the larger developments that are, are moving forward, and it's still not enough. And we can't rely just on these large developments that often require major zoning changes uh, to to enable more housing to be built. So Burlington is currently going through a zoning, uh, reimagining our zoning. Uh, it's called the Neighborhood Code, or it's also called upzoning um, for folks in other communities. And that's going to allow us to do smaller uh, development to add more units on a smaller scale. And so part of what I think we have to be thinking about is both large, medium, and small, and figuring out how to let property owners be able to access um, capital to be able to also build more housing, to change that uh, single-family zoned um, house, or sorry, single-family home, period, uh, into a duplex or a triplex, and really building out the density within communities throughout the city so it doesn't concentrate or over-rely, again, on these large developments, which take years to put together. And also, I think uh, sometimes uh, our inclusionary zoning ordinance, which is great in its premise, but it was developed in the 1990s, where we try to build more affordable units, but developers are allowed to pay a fee instead of actually building the physical new units uh, into a housing trust fund. And I think the equation there also needs to be reexamined to make sure we're actually at the end of the day getting enough physical housing built and keeping up with the pace over the next five, 10 years. Uh, We have a lot of ground to catch up on. And we also don't actually know the actual need, I think, right now in the city with the number of people who are creatively, you know, living on um, in apartments that are probably not three bedroom apartments. They're probably a two bedroom apartment, for example. So I think as we build things out, we'll get a better grasp on what our actual housing needs are and then be able to better adjust five, 10 years from now about how much more housing we're really going to need. Lots to follow there. Emma Mulvady said, before I let you go, I have to ask, since you brought up uh, being the parent of two small children, uh, many times during the campaign, what's it been like in this past week explaining to your two little kids you're you're about to be mayor of their city? Has that hit home for them? <laughs> well, it was set, they had to go to bed before the results were in. Oh. Uh, I had to send them home to go to bed. So I got to tell them in the mor- Wednesday morning, and my daughter's smile was so big and excited. And then, But I could tell she's a little trepidatious about how many bedtimes I'm going to miss. And um, and we were walking. I got to walk her and her brother to school the next morning after the election. And I think there was a real strong, joyful switch in in just the energy I was feeling from people. And it might have been a little bit of Old North End pride. But hmm. as we were walking down North Street uh, to her elementary school, the number of just joyful congratulations and celebrations that were coming out of, you know, I don't know, people walking down the street out of car windows, etc. And then by the time we got to school, just her classmates, she stood a little taller and a little prouder. And I think she's really proud of mom. And, uh, you know, it takes a whole family to run. So I'm very grateful to my wife and to both of my kids for really hanging in there these last four months. It's been a lot to ask of them. And I know it's going to be a lot to ask going forward. But um, I think they understand how how much is at stake and how important this is to have a really um, strong and healthy city for them and their and their friends. State Representative and Burlington Mayor-elect Emma Mulvaney-Stanick, thank you so much for joining us today and congratulations. Thank you so much. Emma Mulvaney-Stanick will be sworn in as Burlington's mayor on April 1st.